Some have used paper towels in the kitchen. Yeah, you're allowed to use paper to wipe your bottoms. <laughs> That's all. I like living the way I live, and I, I live fairly modestly. We live in a small house. I drive an 18-year-old Saturn. <laughs> you know, so we're fairly frugal, but I'm still an American, so that means I use vast amounts of resources no matter how frugal I am. We've got to stop drilling for oil. Uh, it just becomes more and more increasingly difficult uh, to, to cut out the real big things, to be honest with you. As you walk from room to room, turn off your lights. <laughs> it's easy to turn off the lights and to uh, turn down the heat and don't use the air conditioning at all. But then you quickly run into the idea that, you know, am I not going to fly to that conference? Uh, am I going to ride a bike to, you know, the grocery store? We don't examine how we live. We don't examine how we eat. We don't examine that we don't walk upstairs, we go up in a, you know, a thing. When you're in the plane, the hostess hands you a drink with a bloody bit of, you know, a tree beside it. I don't need that paper serviette. Helen Caldicott is riding in an airplane, exposing herself to ten times as much ionizing radiation from cosmic rays as she would experience at sea level. Her airplane is ejecting greenhouse gases directly into the stratosphere, and she's worried about a paper napkin. We went out for buffalo wings, and I turned to her and I said, look, you're, you're going to lead this movement, Bobby Wren. We went out for buffalo wings. Helen Caldicott is eating buffalo wings. I eat meat too, but I recognize that a vegetarian diet emits a third less greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. I don't know if you want to, um, you know, hint at it, but... You know, we're talking about like domestic energy use and you almost can't help it. We're so oblivious to it. So look at this room, <laughs> you know, the, you know, it's uh, I mean, how many lights do we have burning in here? 70, 80 lights to do this interview on how we should be better with energy usage. So, I mean, we can't help but being hypocrites in the West almost, you know, we're, we're almost blind to the availability of energy to us. Just thought I'd say that. Americans don't have any sense of scale as to what we actually need for our daily, to power Chicago, to power New York City, to power, you know. Wind and solar are great ideas. It's just that they, the, the scale is completely off. And people, they, they're, just, they're just missing it. They're just, they're, just, they're just missing it, and it's very frustrating. And you can't just say, well, I've got a full tummy and I'm busy and I can't do it. Every morning you get up and look in the mirror and say, what am I going to do today to save the planet? Don't do little things either. Do big things. Let's do something big. Let's solve the most intractable problem ever to have faced humanity. One that even Helen Caldicott admits we are powerless in the face of. Our desperate need for toilet paper. I wash it when I wash my underpants in the shower. Never use a tree to blow your nose. Don't use trees for anything except maybe when you go to the lavatory. You're allowed to use paper to wipe your bottoms. <laughs> That's all. As any carbon emitting jet setter like Caldicott would know, there's a thing called a bidet. It shoots water upwards to clean your bottom, preferably warm water. In a world of energy abundance made very possible by nuclear power, the bidet could replace toilet paper entirely. Yes, fancy ones even dry you with a blast of warm air. It is so choice. If you have the means, I highly recommend picking one up. A world of sharply constrained energy supply. We've got to stop. Do not, never, never use it. You don't need all this electrical gadgetry. Turn them all off. Makes the bidet a less environmentally friendly proposition because we'd also be constrained by limited fresh water and limited electricity to both warm the water and blow dry our bums. If we decouple energy production from pollution, and with nuclear energy we certainly can, then we can produce as much electricity as we want. Nuclear power can desalinate seawater, an infinite supply of fresh water for drinking, for farming, and for bidets. Nuclear power can produce carbon-free electricity. This allows us to heat the water and to sanitize the water once we've used it. And nuclear power provides carbon-free energy for the manufacture of bidets and the plumbing pipes themselves. 
Energy abundance gives us a bigger toolbox to address environmental concerns. When Caldecott talks about turning off lights and not using hand dryers, she's admitting we'll be trying to solve these environmental problems with less energy. She's admitting our toolbox will be smaller. Most of the solutions will involve changing human behavior rather than simply developing and deploying technology. It's called global preventive medicine. The earth is the patient now, and we're all physicians to the patient. What I practice is global preventive medicine. We're here to serve, and we can save the world. We can save the world from global warming. This mismatch between her stated goal of saving the planet and her actual impact of raising the cost of clean energy is due to her conflation of nuclear weapons with nuclear power. Each reactor makes 500 pounds of plutonium a year. You only need 10 pounds to make a nuclear weapon. So you get the plutonium, which is great because you can make bombs with it. This is incorrect. Only select isotopes of plutonium can be used for weapons. For example, plutonium-238 was the very first isotope of plutonium discovered and cannot be used to make a bomb. We use it in radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Apollo astronauts use plutonium RTGs to power their science equipment. The Mars rover Curiosity is entirely powered by RTGs, enabling a wider array of power-hungry experiments and improved mobility than Spirit or Opportunity ever had. The Mars exploration rovers often found themselves short on power as dust settled on their solar panels. They were the only source of energy, and the Martian winter was approaching. The part of it that really breaks my heart is that we just didn't have power to drive anymore. In fact, any space probe sent beyond the asteroid belt has been powered by RTGs, because at that distance from the Sun, solar panels are useless. A well-powered Curiosity roaming Mars and these spectacular images are all courtesy of plutonium-238. These are the plutonium isotopes found in spent fuel rods. There's plutonium-238. NASA has almost run out of 238. They'd love to get their hands on more 238. I salute you. But if you're Dr. Evil, this organization will not tolerate failure. You want plutonium-239. In fact, you need 90% of the plutonium to be 239, or else you can't make a bomb out of it. And you also need to keep plutonium 240 below 7%. 240 spontaneously fissions. That's a showstopper. Sorry, I farted. So are we choosing between space exploration and weapons here? No, spent fuel from power reactors does not let us do either. We can't fuel space probes with it, we can't fuel Mars rovers with it, and we can't build bombs with it. The plutonium in so-called spent fuel is only useful as fuel in future reactors. That is its only use. Each reactor makes 500 pounds of plutonium a year. You only need 10 pounds to make a nuclear weapon. So you get the plutonium, which is great because you can make bombs with it. A power reactor creates plutonium, which is not weapons grade. This number is zero. Isotopic separation is hard. This is basket weaving 101 of anti-proliferation. Isotopic separation of uranium is an expensive but developed technology. Isotopic separation of plutonium is not. Dig uranium up out of the ground, enrich it all to hell, and you've got weapons grade material. You know, I'm, I don't think we should be uh, building nuclear weapons. In fact, I think nuclear weapons are terrible, but uranium's uranium. It's not exactly like we have a monopoly on the stuff. You know, it's a big planet, everybody's got some. In contrast, a power reactor creates plutonium, which is not weapons grade. Distinguishing between the various isotopes is important. On one side stays uranium-235, which is the one that is the fissionable one, and the other side, actually, it's the reverse, stays U-238, which is non-fissionable, and this is 235. See, Hella knows what an isotope is, so long as we're talking about uranium isotopes and how uranium isotopic enrichment adds to the cost of nuclear power. But plutonium isotopes... They can make 50 bombs a year. What's an isotope? When Helen speaks, many people make contributions large and small to the organization. 
The last two chapters of this book are very exciting because they give you the prescription for survival. Oh, windmills! I don't like the look of those windmills. Too bloody bad! Better to have windmills than nuclear power plants, which are cancer factories. People waking up in their morning, their babies born deformed, like the babies at Chernobyl. Do you want to see the picture of the babies at Chernobyl? Do you want me to hold your mic? No. I'm on a roll. She said to me, how much do you need? And I went, uh, 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 $100,000. She said, the check will be in the mail tomorrow. And it was. So we set up an office in K Street. So we have people who send in $15 a month. And then we've also had a number of individual donors who've made larger gifts, five, twenty-five, a hundred thousand dollars $100,000 to the Institute to support Helen and the work that she does of ending the nuclear age.